My dear friends, good day. So, if I say religion, reassure me you don't immediately think of the gods of farts and farting. You rather imagine big temples like churches or mosques with serious, concentrated ceremonies inside with a ritual that maybe escapes you a bit. In short, you have a rather modern and western idea of religion, except that throughout history, it's sometimes been different and even funny. I hope you're comfortable because I warn you, we're going to discover some rather unusual gods. And with our modern moral criteria, we wouldn't consider them very healthy. Come on, let's go. Having been several times to Hellfest, believe me, our first goddess would be very well received there. I think I can even say that she would have her temple right in the middle of it, and nobody would mind. Indeed, in the 3rd millennium BC, Ninkasi was the Sumerian goddess of beer. She is also known as Cyrus, which means fermentation in Akkadian, another ancient Mesopotamian language. Beyond the funny anecdote, divinizing a drink is anything but trivial. It shows the cultural importance that beer had at the time. Indeed, barley was probably one of the first crops of humanity and would have accompanied its development, its sedentarization, and thus the appearance of the first cities in Mesopotamia, now disappeared. So, she, not to say, haha, well done Mesopotamians, your civilization has collapsed, no. She, that's just how barley is called in Sumerian, an essential cereal. By the way, the famous epic of Gilgamesh tells that Enkidu, a real savage, reaches civilization by going through different stages and, among those, getting drunk on beer, proof that we are indeed human. As much as to say that the Mesopotamians do not joke with this drink, hence the cult rendered to Ninkasi, which was rediscovered only in the 20th century thanks to a clay tablet. In 1991, Miguel Civil managed to translate it. It was called the Hymn to Ninkasi. The song traces all the steps to brew Mesopotamian beer. Thanks to him, we know that this beverage was not really like what we drink today much stronger and thicker, more like a kind of porridge. Sumerian beer was a real liquid bread made from dry barley bread that was soaked in water to ferment. Honey and date syrup were then added to it. So, sorry, I can't conclude by wishing you strength and hops because there were no hops. This plant was absolutely unknown there, but take comfort in the fact that the next god is also related to festive drinks. Come on, let's take a little tour of the planet to land with the Mexicans, or rather their ancestors of the 12th and 16th centuries, the Aztecs. The people who dominated this region had a vast polytheistic pantheon. And among all these gods, the one that interests us is Tezcatzoncatl. His name, a little bit hard to pronounce, means the one who has hair like a mirror, and he is usually represented with a crown of flowers, associated with pleasure and entertainment. Tezcatzoncatl is simply the god of wine and inebriation. So, I can already hear people saying, wine, joy, the vegetal crown on the head. Wouldn't it be a bit like Dionysus of the Greeks by any chance? Well, not really, because there again, the Aztec wine is not exactly like ours. In fact, we're talking about pulque, a slightly alcoholic drink obtained by fermenting agave sap. So, it's far from being the only drink of the Aztecs, because if Tezcatzoncatl is the most important god of wine, well, he's not the only one. They would have up to 400 brothers. Each one would represent, according to the versions, either a different fermented drink or a mental state provoked by the psychotropic. Drunkenness, joy, sadness, anger, etc. So many nuances that reveal that once again, this alcohol must have played a great role in Aztec society, to the point of ritualizing its consumption. Because in addition to having hundreds of booze gods, the Aztecs celebrated it with a drinking game, the short straw, or rather, the straw with a hole in it. Every year on a specific date, 303 priests of the great god Tezcatzoncatl gather. They sing a song to give him thanks. Then each one collects a reed. Out of the 303 reeds, only one is pierced. The one who pulled it must then drink pulque like crazy. In the end, only one of them has a monstrous hangover, while 302 players stay in the water. Come on, next god. And now we're heading to India with a goddess still revered today in the Hindu pantheon. If you think that Hanuman with his monkey head, Ganesh with his elephant head, or Kali with his four arms are a bit weird, well, hang on. Because Chinamasta is even stranger. 
Imagine a giant lotus flower. Put on it a couple in full sexual frolic. Add on top of this couple a half-naked woman with red skin. Ah, and her body is clutched by a cobra and she is wearing a necklace of human skulls around her neck. One wonders what this jewel is for considering that the woman has decapitated herself. In one hand, she holds her blade and in the other, her poor head. From her neck, streams of blood are collected in cups by other women who drink it and and here I am introducing Chinamasta, the Hindu goddess of the Tantric tradition, who is always represented like this. Hinduism is a very complex religion. Each of its gods has the habit of having different names, different aspects, and of subdividing into other entities or on the contrary of grouping together. This is the case of Chinamasta, who is part of the group of the Ten Mahavidya Goddesses, the Ten Wisdoms. Each of them represents in reality one of the aspects of a single goddess, Durga the wife of Shiva, one of the major Hindu gods. So, okay, but how much of Durga is Chinamasta? Well, again, it's complicated. To summarize, she is a goddess of paradoxes who represents both death and life. She is often associated with the question of food, the fact of bringing food, or even the notion of motherhood. But on the other hand, she also represents sacrifice as well as dominating and self-sufficient sexual power. Besides, the couple she is perched on is Kama, the god of love, and Rati, the goddess of lust. So, I'll clarify anyway if it's not clear to you. Self-sufficient sexual power. Yes, that's what you think, Chinamasta, she is the goddess of masturbation and of the nurturing mother. So, I'll leave you to deal with this weird association of ideas and I really hope that the next god will be a little bit less sexual. The next god, less sexual? Well, no, it's not. What are we going to talk about now? Of course, the Chinese god of sodomy, right? For a change. We say hello to Zhou Wang, one of the deities of Chinese Taoism. But be careful, the internet traps us by saying everywhere that Zhou Wang's thing is really sodomy. While if you look for it, it's not necessarily true. First of all, Zhou Wang refers to someone who really existed in the 11th century BCE. King Di Xin, the last ruler of the Shang Dynasty. Okay, so the problem is that between historical chronicles, fiction, and mythological accounts, we are not sure that Di Xin really lived. But his legend did exist. Moreover, the mythological Zhou Wang does appear in several writings of Confucius, but it is Xu Zhonglin who makes him truly famous in his historical novel of the 16th century, The Investiture of the Gods. In this text, he is a good, efficient, and popular king but who descends into debauchery as a result of a divine curse. From that point on, he spends all his time wallowing in orgies to the point that when he dies, he becomes the god of debauchery. So, second point, he is rather a god of debauchery in general and not of sodomy in particular. Besides, Zhou Wang didn't stay that way for long and today he's worshipped for something else entirely. In fact, he is not responsible for these bad habits since they come from a divine curse. The legend of Zhou Wang says that other gods gave him justice. From then on, he becomes the star of happiness, a much more positive god who has all the power over marriage affairs, including the extramarital affairs that threaten the couple. So we've gone from the god of sodomy to the god of marriage, and it's not quite the same tea. So sorry to have broken the myth, but it still allows us to discover a very common archetype of Chinese mythology, namely a mortal character, historical or fictional, who becomes so popular he is made a god. Zhou Wang's far from being the only one. And now it's the turn of the goddess of the sewers. So, beware, her story has also been a bit complicated. In fact, malicious authors have tried to bring her down to earth. Cloacina was originally a goddess of the Etruscans, but the Romans took her over and turned her into an epithet for Venus. This is how Venus Cloacina was born, who rules over the Cloaca Maxima, the great sewer of Rome. And now you'll have to explain to me how Venus, the goddess of beauty, seduction, and love, ended up ruling this big pile of poo. Well, you see, it's actually logical. In Latin, cloacina means the purifier. So this Venus represents the virtue of purification of sexual unions, which is obviously one of the attributes of the goddess of love. On the other hand, no Roman pagan author makes her a goddess of the sewers in herself. In fact, the only ones who say this are later authors, all of whom are Christians and who delight in dishonoring the ancient religion. They have two arguments for that. 
According to Lactantius, who lived around the 3rd and 4th centuries, the statue of Venus Cloacina was found in the sewers. Plus, there is a common etymological basis, since cloaca means sewers and in fact gave the French cloac. This then reminds us of cloacina, which has the same meaning of removing dirt, of purifying. For Lactantius and all of the Christians after him, it's an easy way to make fun of the figure of Venus and the absurdities of the pagan pantheon in general. Voila! So, actually, no, Cloacina is not as disgusting as that. But I put her in anyway for a little reminder, because in history you need to never forget who writes the source and what the author's bias is. Last god of this list, my little darling. I confess that's why I teased him from the introduction of the episode. I'm really not joking with you because here, we're going to meet a civilization that we rarely have time to talk about the Inuits of Greenland and Canada. Those who have not yet converted to Christianity still maintain an animist religion. That is to say, they worship the spirits of nature. Among them is Machish Kapu, the spirit of the anus, who communicates with farts. Hmm. No, no, I didn't say anything. Continue. In the Inuit belief, Machish Kapu is both a facetious and humorous spirit, but also an extremely powerful being to be taken seriously. He is said to be one of the most important spirits capable of controlling both animal spirits and human behavior. That's why the Inuit always refer to him with respect, the Great Chief, Machish Kapu. And the Great Chief has his own way of communicating with us poor mortals who are not worthy of him. Every time someone farts, it's not his fault. It's Machish Kapu who communicates. Because if you listen carefully, Every fart is a word, a song, or the imitation of an animal. Some Inuit claim that they are able to decipher what the powerful spirit is saying, which is very useful, especially in hunting and fishing expeditions. There, the arrival of a father breaking the icy silence of the polar expanses immediately takes on a special meaning that must be deciphered. Either the god is simply joyful, or he is giving an indication for the continuation of the hunt. Now, Machish Kapu can predict the future, so interpreting farts, it's really important. This is divination. Another proof of Machish Kapu's importance is that he is capable of getting angry, especially when one does not share the fruit of hunting or fishing with the rest of the community. Mutual aid is an almost religious virtue in traditional Inuit society, since it is necessary for survival in an extremely hostile environment. So if you anger the spirits, constipation will hit you, and you might even die. You've been warned. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you all. I hope you are very happy to learn such useful tips for your life. <laughs> now you know you have to share. And then you have a rock-solid excuse. The next time there's an accident in the elevator, you can say, It's not me. It's Machish Kapu. I hope you liked the six gods, that they made you laugh. If some of them seem ridiculous, it's because in France, Christianity, Islam, or Judaism have a transcendent sacred. It's separated from the material world, but that is a rather rare vision of the sacred. In fact, in the majority of religions, like Japanese Shintoism, for example, the sacred is imminent. That's to say it's part of the material world. So just about anything can be the object of a cult. So now you know. Thank you all for watching this episode. Thanks to Damien Trontenier from the Religare channel who prepared it. Feel free to check his work. Thanks also to Nicolas Henri for his help on mythology and Chinese pronunciation. See you soon to talk about history, legends, or mythology. Bye.